not enough chips. That situation can make a party a lot less fun. It can also make cookies a lot less tasty. It can apparently also slow down the global economy significantly. Thanks in part to the global pandemic, we now face a significant shortage of semiconductors worldwide. Dare I say it, a chip famine. There aren't enough chips. But don't worry, folks. The president has announced that he's going to study the problem for 100 days. Let's talk about that. Back when I was a kid, the world was largely analog. I remember the rise of digital computing from the debut of gaming consoles and personal computers to the first cellular phones. I have received paychecks that were printed using a hand-set mechanical device, and I've seen credit card transactions processed using a manual credit card machine. Yes, folks, in my lifetime, most everyday devices transitioned from mechanical to electronic, and I'm not even 50 yet. Many things use semiconductors now that didn't 50 years ago in 1971. Phones, cars, televisions, clocks, heating and air conditioning equipment, medical monitoring and testing devices. All of these used to be purely mechanical or analog, but now contain electronics instead. A lot of other devices have been replaced by the single most important invention in the last century, the digital computer. Think about this. In 1971, it was already possible for someone like me to create a series of short films. It would have required audio recording equipment, a camera, editing equipment, magnetic tapes for recording the audio, and film for recording the visuals, but it still would have been possible in theory, although all of that equipment would have been prohibitively expensive and the entire process would have taken days or even weeks to produce just 15 minutes of content. Now, thanks to electronics, Millions of content creators can recreate the same short content in hours instead of days, or days instead of weeks, all while working alone with a relatively inexpensive set of equipment and some software applications. In 1971, 50 years ago, the amount of audiovisual content produced worldwide counted in the tens of thousands of hours for the entire year. As of May 2019, nearly two years ago, about 500 hours worth of audiovisual material was uploaded to YouTube every minute, translating to several times more audiovisual content created and uploaded to just one website every day than was produced worldwide in the entire year of 1971. That's just one example of how integral to our lives semiconductor chips have become. All of those changes happened since 1971, the year of the first commercial scale production of semiconductors. And right now, we don't have enough of them. This has happened before, of course. In 1988, for example, Nintendo experienced a huge bottleneck in production of their consoles, despite the fact that their chip producers were working around the clock at maximum capacity. That chip famine had workers at seven Hitachi factories working through their summer vacations. In 1994, another chip famine occurred due to problems with manufacturing quality of the new processed chips. In 2000, there was a chip famine at Intel due to the demand for Pentiums. 2004, a famine in CDMA chips used for cell phones happened. In 2011, there was a shortage of NAND memory due to a chip famine. These chip famines haven't usually happened due to a significant loss of manufacturing capacity. Semiconductor manufacturing has experienced excellent growth rates for decades. The problems are most often either manufacturing quality issues or high demand for chips. The current chip famine is tied to some disruptions in manufacturing, which happen to coincide with significant increases in demand. Customers typically want the latest chips when they purchase new computer hardware, especially since chip developers are creating new chip processes every two years or so. With the COVID lockdowns, a significant number of people have been attempting to work from home, and in the process, they've discovered that their computer equipment is not up to the job. Chip manufacturers invest a huge amount of money into their production facilities, billions of dollars for each fabrication site, and billions more to upgrade older sites to produce the newest chips. Most governments have invested significant amounts of money in order to expand their own domestic semiconductor production. China is especially keen on doing this. There are hundreds of fabrication sites which can produce the wafers which chips are made from all over the world. 
but so far there are only two companies who can produce the latest 5 nanometer chips, TSMC and Samsung. Both of these companies are working to increase the number of fab sites they have producing 5 nanometer chips, all the while continuing production on older chips like the currently used 7 nanometer and 10 nanometer chips. That's right, semiconductor manufacturers also produce older chip scales. For example, TSMC is still producing chips at scales up to 130 nanometers on a commercial level, and that process is 20 years old. Why? Because there's still a demand for chips from that process scale for some applications. The processors in smart weapons, for example, use older chip scales up to half a micron, a hundred times larger in process scale than the new 5 nanometer chips. There have been at least 10 new generations of chip manufacturing process since 2000, roughly half of all the scaling changes since the introduction of commercial integrated circuitry. And most of the scales that were developed since 2000 are still in commercial production. Meanwhile, the next two process generations, 3 nanometer and 2 nanometer, are already in development and should enter commercial production in the next few years. By 2035, we may hit the wall on scale reduction when the manufacturers reach the hard limit on silicon transistor density at the atomic level of around 0.2 nanometers. At that point, manufacturing will likely settle down into a more long-term production pattern, and costs per unit of computing power may start to decrease unless they can find another way to bypass technical and physical limits on miniaturization. President Biden has recognized our chip famine. Ordering a study on the manufacturing of semiconductors, large capacity batteries, rare earth elements, and pharmaceuticals, which will take at least 100 days. That's his solution. Study the problems for three and a half months. As far as manufacturing disruptions, I could point out that locking down countries due to a pandemic might have something to do with it. I could also point out that building new manufacturing facilities or updating existing facilities is enormously expensive and time consuming. Rapid construction for a fabrication site takes at least a couple of years, and due to the changes in production methodology, so does upgrading existing facilities. Then again, I could also point out that attempting to create too much production capacity for a new chip scale all at once risks tens of billions of dollars on a bet that current chip processes will sell enough units to recoup that investment before a new chip process supersedes it. Moore's Law, which states that current semiconductor complexity will double approximately every two years, argues against making that kind of a gamble. The fact of the matter is that the bulk of latest generation semiconductor manufacturing is currently concentrated in Asia, especially the new process manufacturing. Many companies like Apple, AMD, and NVIDIA, who sell computers and cards, are actually fabless companies, meaning that they have companies like TSMC and Samsung produce their chips for them. Others, like Intel, Micron, and Texas Instruments, are integrated device manufacturers. IDM companies own production facilities, but in many cases, they have located their fab sites overseas. Why? Because semiconductor manufacturing uses toxins which can cause cancer, birth defects, and miscarriage. It uses poisonous elements like arsenic, antimony, and phosphorus as doping agents to produce the semiconductor matrix that goes into the wafers. It also requires the use of a lot of water, which creates a potential groundwater contamination hazard in addition to all of the potential exposure hazards inside the fab facilities. Now, the manufacturers are aware of the risks and have done their best to mitigate them. Semiconductor manufacturing is therefore one of the safest industries according to OSHA's records, but it's still less expensive to set up manufacturing overseas rather than in the United States. Not to mention easier to build a new fab site in a country with less restrictions on the use of potentially hazardous chemicals. Now the United States is allocating $37 billion for domestic fab site development. But U.S. companies have yet to take advantage of those funds. Meanwhile, just TMC and Samsung are investing $58 billion of company money into new fab sites, besides the hundreds of billions of dollars which are provided by other countries. I'd hazard a guess that similar circumstances exist to bottleneck production of large capacity batteries and pharmaceuticals. I can tell you based on my past research into rare earth elements that U.S. deposits are not being exploited due to environmental concerns and the associated costs. In fact, there are significant deposits in mid-America, including a deposit which reaches from Arkansas to Iowa 
and which may actually contain more recoverable rare earth element resources than China's currently proven reserves. Since the bottleneck on large capacity battery production is due to a lack of rare earth element resources in the United States, it's quite possible to fix the resource problems faced by LCAP battery producers. But that would require us to consider how to start, restart, or boost domestic production of rare earth elements without creating environmental hazard. This problem is similar to the problem that exists for semiconductor manufacturers. As far as pharmaceutical companies go, they face a completely different set of problems. We actually know what many of those problems are already. The real question with pharmaceutical production is what to do about them. Whoa. Maybe I could have saved the taxpayers millions of dollars if only I had looked into these problems a bit sooner. Personally, my issue isn't the chip famine. Chip famines have occurred before, and I'm betting that they will happen again. My real issue is that President Biden is mostly just studying the problem for the next few months, and the report he receives will likely seek to assign blame rather than addressing how we can solve these problems. That's an ongoing issue that I have with all such responses from government. Biden's study is looking into causes, not how to fix problems. Studying the source of the problem solves nothing. It's useful only for fixing blame and for providing cover for either passing the buck to the next administration or using a bill that addresses one or two issues that are part of the problem as an excuse to sneak a lot of unpopular legislative measures unrelated to those problems into law. In three and a half months, Biden will be able to denounce some scapegoats without actually doing anything to solve the problem. Perhaps he's hoping that these problems will sort themselves out in that time. In any case, we still have a chip famine for the time being. It's going to hurt manufacturing for a while until demand settles down and production catches up. But we will have chips again, so long as those dips in Washington, D.C. let us solve the problem.